And this morning, uh, if you ha- I, I don't like to say if you have your Bibles. I assume most of you have a Bible. And we'll be in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 24, as we consider this subject, Lessons from the Table. Really? Yeah, we stop and think about it. Now, good things happen at the table, do they not? I mean, I grew up in a family, there was, there was uh, seven of us kids. And when you have seven kids, some of them dropped out before the other ones dropped in. But there were still a lot of people at the table. And we were not well-to-do, but dinner time, you know, would find us all sitting around the table. And uh, a lot of good things happened at that table. My mom was a very good cook. Uh, She did the best she could with what she had to work with, and so I just have lots of fond memories of the table. You know, uh, we went for over a year without having the table between us, fellowships, uh, here at Rye Hill Baptist Church, not just us, other people as well. They finally decided to have an all-church fellowship on the Sunday that we left. So I don't have any memories of that table. But I have lots of memories of tables in the past, both here and in other churches, where Christians just get together and fellowship around the table. There's always plenty of food, but it's not just the food, is it? It's the fellowship. We like that. Uh, the table in many cultures around the world is uh, a very special part of life. And, uh, you know, it used to be quite a bit more that way here in America, but these days I wonder, because I've been in a restaurant, maybe you've seen this, maybe you have been this. When you have a family of four sitting at a table in a restaurant, and every one of them has one of these things out. Anybody here have a cell phone? Okay, you can go ahead and admit it. I won't call you out. I just hope that when they're doing this, they're not talking to one another on the phone at the table. Good things happen at the table. In Jesus' day and culture, mealtime was immensely important. And so it's not surprising that uh, Jesus used this very familiar setting for many teachings. Matter of fact, The table for eating, dining, is all over the Gospels. Did you ever notice that? The first recorded miracle of Jesus is at the table. And one of the last events with Jesus and the disciples was breakfast on the beach. And in between, there's table talk, wherever you go. In this particular passage, we're going to look at three lessons that Jesus gives us in the form of parables and instruction, lessons at the table. Uh, In the first part, we're going to see, uh, we want to see ourselves as God sees us. In the second part, we want to see the less fortunate as God sees them. And in the last part, we want to see the lost as God sees them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these teachings that are timeless. We pray, Father, as we handle your word this morning, we would do so with your spirit giving us utterance. We just pray, Father, that the words would give us meaning that we can apply to our lives, no matter where we are in our Christian pilgrimage. We just pray, Father, that once we have applied these truths, that we'll live more and more consistently with Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, now, uh, everything in the Bible comes in a context, and so we're going to start on, uh, in verse 7, but well, the first six verses actually kind of set the stage, and I'll just kind of summarize those for you. If you've got your Bible over, you can glance over them. Bottom line is Jesus has been invited to a, a meal at the home of a prominent uh, Pharisee. Now, this is kind of unusual. As you know, they were usually hounding him, and, and this event takes place not early in Jesus' ministry, but actually quite late in Jesus' ministry when he is actually started on the road. To Jerusalem for what would be the time of his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He's got the cross on the horizon. And a prominent Pharisee invites him to, for dinner. Uh, Jesus is not picky. He had, he had lunch with Zacchaeus, a hated tax collector. He even is willing to have a meal with a member of the religious right. You see, he's just not picky. 
And, and in the course of having this meal at the home of the Pharisee, he heals somebody that shows up with dropsy, which is a, a kind of a disease that probably could mean several different things, but it, the bottom line is uh, there's a retention of fluids and it's just not a pretty thing. Why is this guy here? Why did the Pharisee invite this person? Because he wouldn't have just shown up. But why is he here? I wonder if he wasn't there so that the Pharisee and the other Pharisees would see what Jesus would do because it, everybody knew he healed people. And everybody knew that he healed people on the Sabbath, and they did not like that. There are a multitude of examples of Jesus healing on the Sabbath day, and they did not like that. They thought that was work, and you shouldn't work on the Sabbath. Or as they used to say, thou shalt not raise the sweat on the Sabbath. But he healed him, and he said, what do you think, guys? You think uh, healing is a good thing on the Sabbath or, or not? They didn't answer him a word. He heals the person, and they couldn't say a word about it. What are you supposed to say? Oh, go back and get sick again. They couldn't say anything about it. So anyway, he, he, this sets the tone. And he's sitting at, you know, i got to believe that when Jesus was at the table, can you imagine this? When Jesus was at the table, everybody's watching Jesus. Now, I hope that when I'm at the table, everybody's not watching me. I might reach for a second portion or a third. I may have something coming down on my chin that I don't notice. But when Jesus is at the table, people are kind of watching Jesus. So Jesus seizes the moment to give them some lessons. And the first lesson we see is we, we need to learn to see ourselves as God sees us. Verse 7 says this, So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the best places saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him will come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invites you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you'll have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. See yourself as God sees you. Now, this idea of picking the best places at the table uh, was not completely a, a, an unknown custom of the day. Uh, there were, even though it wasn't a true caste society, some people were just viewed by others as a little bit better than others. We know that Jews were better than Gentiles. We know that within the Jewish community, those who were more orthodox in their beliefs were better than those who practiced their beliefs casually. In Jesus' time, the, the, the Jews that had resisted Hellenism saw themselves as better than the Hellenistic Jews and all kinds of things like this. Definitely the the poor people were, were not, not as good as, as others. And that's kind of, so it wasn't completely uncommon to see this happening. But Jesus says, don't do that. Because there may be two things that you're unaware of. Now, the first thing is the presumption uh, that you're just better than everybody else. Now, I'm just curious. You don't have to answer this. Do you know someone who thinks they're better? than everyone else. I'm not talking about in Washington, okay? I'm talking about right here in the River Valley, okay? Maybe somebody you work with, maybe even somebody in your family. Praise the Lord. And so some of us tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But Jesus says, don't do that. He says, you know, in truth, you're not as important as you think you are. Yeah, I, I, I think about people that cut in line. Uh, oh, that really bugs me, okay? If you're a line cutter, see me after church and we'll pray, all right? That really bugs me. You stand and you wait in that line, whether it's at an airport or whether it's at a sporting event or whatever it is, and you've waited your turn. And here comes somebody and they just slide right in. Hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in so long. I hate that. I just want you to know. 
I'm liable to be one of those people that says something. I know you're not supposed to. My wife is always telling me, she says, Thurman, you've got to quit that. Somebody's going to hit you one of these days. <laughs> if they get in a car that has a Rye Hill Baptist Church bumper sticker, you're going to be in trouble. I, I, I don't like line cutters. How about people that monopolize a conversation? You know anybody like that? You know, you're, if you had a dream, they had a better one. If you're sick, they're sicker. You know, if, if, you, if you've got a story to tell, they'll interrupt you at the first chance, and then they'll monopolize the conversation. And a lot of times what they're talking about is about me, 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 me. Did you ever notice that? Well, I did this, and I went there. You know, I be honest with you, nobody is immune to this. When I was at Bible college, I'll never forget this one guy that we had as a guest speaker. And we had a lot of good, very uh, excellent guest speakers from, you know, many different walks of life. And this particular guy, I just remember all I heard the whole time he was talking was about I, and I, and I, and I was in Europe last week, and I talked to so-and-so, and when I've done this, and when I was here, and I don't know what the man's message was. He might have had a perfectly good message, but all I ever got out of it to this day is I. And I think God would look down and I said, stop talking about I. You're not so great after all. But there's another element here that we don't want to miss, okay? Jesus said, don't do that. He said, it's better, far better. Take the low place. Who knows? The host may come to you and say, oh, no, 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 this is not the place for you, Charles. I want you up front. I want you to come to the front of the table. And then Steve has to get up. <laughs> I've been at table with Steve. I just want you to know that, okay, many times. And he has got the table down. He needs no training in that area. <laughs> but it's a different perspective. You see, here's what I believe. I believe that there are plenty of people in any given uh, people group, whether it's at a, in work, whether it's in your community, whether it's in a church, whether whatever, in any people group, there are many who think that they're all that when they're not. But I also believe in any given people group, there are those that have much more value than they ever give themselves credit for. I've known them. You've known them too. These are the people who do just about anything for you and want absolutely no recognition. These are the people that know what Jesus was talking about when he said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. These are the people that stay late to take care of something that nobody else wants to do. That pray for the people that nobody else wants to pray for. Cora Bradley, write that name down. She's on the saints' roll in heaven. I assure you this. She was the only person, one of the few, I can't say the only because my memory is not that perfect. One of the few that invited a young preacher and his wife and their five kids to her table. Lots of other people in the church didn't happen. Core Bradley did. And we felt that we were honored guests the whole time. Even our rowdy boys felt like honored guests. And there was plenty of food to go around. And then she sent stuff with us back to the house. There's Cora Bradleys in this church. I know that. And Jesus says, that's the kind of person you really need to be. There'll always be plenty of people that are high and mighty. But the kingdom's made up of people that will humbly just care for people and then let God take care of the accolades. Jesus told his disciples, many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. In Romans chapter 12, which is a very practical chapter in the book of Romans, as we know, it's very 
very much uh, doctrinal, the book of Romans is, but, but chapter 12 is just very basic uh, uh, stuff. And, and in, in Romans 12, verse 15, Paul says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. I think that's what Jesus is trying to convey to these Pharisees and friends of the Pharisees at the table and what he wants to convey to us as well today. So this first segment is directed clearly to the guests. Now in this next segment, he's going to direct his focus to the host. In verse 12, Jesus says this, Then he also said to him who invited him. By the way, it's probably not good form when somebody invites you over for dinner to start chastising them. By the way, you know, you should probably have put out your better china. These styrofoam plates just don't cut it. Uh, My water glass has spots on it. Yeah, that probably wouldn't get you a second invitation, I'm guessing. But Jesus can say pretty much whatever he wants to say. And Jesus doesn't waste an opportunity. Hey, Jesus knows. Remember, the cross is looming, okay? He said, I got X amount of time on planet Earth. I'm here at a table. These people are watching me. They're listening. I got some things, and I'm just going to tell them. So he did. He said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back. And you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Man, that's powerful stuff. Now, I want to quickly say that New Testament language is no different than our language. And we say some things uh, to, to make a point that are a little bit exaggerated. So when Jesus says, don't invite your family, he doesn't mean, if you invited your family over to dinner, Denise, that's a sin. No, that's not what he means. Not what he means at all. It's, it's an exaggeration to make a point. He said, if that's the only people you ever, ever do anything for, whether it's a meal or whether it's some other act of kindness, if you keep it all to your close friends and family, you're missing a blessing. It's exactly what he's saying. You're missing a blessing. He said, look, you know that sooner or later the day's going to come, they're going to invite you over. I have a good friend. I have breakfast with him. We used to try to do it once a week. It's usually about once a month these days. But, uh, <laughs> we used to try to keep track of it. So you buy this week, and I'll buy next week. Well, if you miss two weeks, whose turn is it? I don't remember. Who? And, 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 and so eventually we said, okay, here's the deal. Uh, we're just going to... Dutch treat, except my birthday he buys, his birthday I buy. So it's just Dutch treat, and that worked pretty well until we realized, okay, uh, who prays? Well, you prayed last time, so I'm praying this time. And who leaves the tip? Okay, if you pray, you pay, okay? (laughs) Worked pretty good for a while until we forgot, and we've been out for three or four weeks. Who prayed last time? I don't know. You see, you're going to get back. You see, and that's kind of the thing is, is, is you, you know, I want, if I give something, I want something back in return. That's very American, by the way. Uh, I, 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 want, I want something back, maybe in the form of material compensation, or maybe in the form of some favor, or some recognition. Hey, at least you should have sent me a thank you card. But we want something. And Jesus said, that's not the right way to do it. How about doing this instead? How about share an act of kindness with somebody that has no way on earth to repay you? Jesus did. He died on a cross for me. I can't repay that. And the thing is, 
the opportunities are limitless. Because there's a lot of people hurting in the world. You may not be able to have them all over for dinner. I realize that, especially during COVID. Ugh. But that doesn't mean you can't reach out in some way, some form or fashion to someone who has no ability on earth to repay you. And don't go bragging about it. Well, you know, I had a guy in one of our churches. I don't know who it was. He, he had a car dealership. He was pretty, pretty wealthy for this little church we was in. And uh, every year he would sponsor a family, buy their Christmas for them. Meals, presents for the kids, all this kind of stuff. Great thing to do, right? And then you heard every detail about it. And you know what Jesus says? That person's already got his blessing. He ain't going to get nothing in the kingdom. But when you do these things, and he says you're blessed because they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You see, Jesus doesn't miss those things. He knows what's going on, and he knows where your heart is. He knows where my heart is. See the less fortunate as God sees them, people that need something that just maybe you can provide. Maybe given to benevolent charities. And of course, we all give to the cooperative program. We know we reach people with spiritual and physical needs all around the world. And we should be very proud of that. There's other charities that, that merit our support as we are able. Uh, participating in the holiday food distribution. Those are always big. You know, this, I'll tell you, Rye Hill's not got a whole big problem in this area when it comes to if somebody stands up here, which is usually Michael Franklin, who's in absence today, and says, we need to fill the pantry, we're going to get stuff to fill the pantry. And our pantry workers, if our pantry's not full, please let me know after the service. I'll start calling people. <laughs> no. I just, just get. But there's always opportunities like that. There are community things going on where you can... You know, I always love to see, our paper doesn't have a whole lot of news in it. I, I just call it a paper anymore. It's really not a newspaper. But usually during the holidays, they'll run some pictures of people that are standing in the serving line on Thanksgiving Day instead of being at their table, doling out food for people who have no way in the world to repay them. That means a lot to me. Uh, Luke chapter 6, just go back a few pages. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says this. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And then the third part of... Uh, of this section of God's Word, the third lesson from the table, is to see the lost as God sees them. See the lost at God, as God sees them. And there's really two distinct points in this, and I will point those out momentarily. First, uh, verses 15 uh, through 20 now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, remember what he's been doing is chastising the guests and chastising the host, okay? And instead of running out, one of the guests says, he hears these things, and it, it's like a light goes on. He said, man, okay, this is great stuff, Jesus. Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You see, the, the, the Jews have traditionally a belief in... A future kingdom. They believe in the resurrection, a resurrection, not the same thing that we believe, but they believe in a resurrection. They believe in a future kingdom, and they believe that some people are going to be there and some people are not. Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. You see, even in the kingdom of God, there's the table. Read all about it in Revelation. And so Jesus said to him, he said, you know, I, you're on to something here, friend, but I think you might be missing something as well. So he tells a parable. 
He says, a, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Now, this is a this is big, big guy, you know, big table, big house, you know. And, and so it's a great supper. He invited many, and he sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. And they with all one they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another says, well, I've married a wife. I can't come. What? Now, one of the things that we should realize is that in Jesus' time, having a feast and inviting many was a process of time. You didn't just call them on the phone or send them a text message. How many of you have a cell phone? I'm just kidding. So there were preparations to be made. So what would hap typically happen, you'd send your servants out and say, there's going to be a feast on such and such a day, you have been invited. Then, when the feast was ready, which could be a week later, the servants would go back out and say, everything's ready, come on, and let's, let's dine. So there's a period of time from the time they were first invited to the time that the servants come and say, it's all ready. So it starts to look like these excuses are a little bit lame. I mean, if this really was a problem, you couldn't have taken care of it before you accepted the invitation. Did you not know, that, okay, if I bought a piece of land, I better go look at it. It starts to collapse. And then you start looking at the excuses themselves, and it collapses even further. I mean, what person buys a piece of land and hasn't gone to look at it in any century? If you're one of those that would buy a piece of land without looking at it, please see me after the service. What kind of a person buys five yoke of oxen? Now, I don't have one yoke of oxen, I'll just tell you. But what kind of person would buy, and, and oxen were a very important animal in, in, in Jesus' day and in the agri, uh, agricultural uh, environment that, that he worked and, and taught. And so five well, yoke of oxen, that's a pretty good purchase, all right? Who would buy five yoke of oxen and not even have it looked at them to see, do they have all of their teeth? I mean, these things could be dogs. How do you know? No, they would have probably, if they really did buy five yoke of oxen, they already knew if they could pull. Now, the third guy kind of has an excuse. Now, you just look at Jesus and said, hey, all I got to say is this, Jesus, I just got married. What do you want to do about that? No, even this, I mean, the marriage... Uh, process in, this, in Jesus' culture, as we know from uh, Matthew and the account of, of Joseph and Mary, was typically a one-year process. They were espoused, they lived apart for a year, they were engaged and had the marriage ceremony, all like that. So if this guy just got married, it's been going on for a long time. Why accept an invitation if you know that you just can't come? The excuses are all lame excuses. You know, just because you have it doesn't mean they will come. Whether we're talking about a baseball field or a banquet or some community function that sounds good. And, you know, I... I, I I'm not one of these kind of preachers, but I've been around this kind of preacher that if they have something they want everybody to volunteer for, they will find a way to get everybody to come forward to the altar. Everybody. They'll start out with, if, you, if the Lord is burdening your soul, that don't get you enough. Then they'll start saying, well, if you've ever had somebody that was in need, they'll get some more people and say, well, if you love Jesus, then you need to come. I'm not ever going to do that to you, by the way, okay? Of course, I only preach here once in a while, so you can't speak for anybody else. Just because, and, and so what happens is a lot of people volunteer. And then the day comes, and people start saying, well, I just bought a car, and I need to go drive it. 
Uh, we're getting ready to move, and I've got to go look at a house. I just met a girl. Might get married. And nobody shows up. I've been there at those embarrassing moments when a very good plan with what could have been a wonderful outreach fell flat on its face because when push came to shove, people just didn't show up. But there's more to the story. Verse 21. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry. Now, he's put out an awful lot for this banquet. It's just a parable, folks, okay? But still, if you're having a banquet for a lot of people, you've put out a lot of time, effort, and money to get this thing underway. You're expecting a good show. Master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. These are the people in the culture of that time that were not typically ever going to be invited to a dinner because they were second-rate citizens. They really were. You know, in a, there was, there's been a time in America where people with disabilities oftentimes were considered second-rate citizens. Should never be the case. But these people really didn't have anybody to invite them over. And so he's mad. He said, "Go, get, we're going to fill up. We're going to have a banquet anyway. You see, I love this. You know, and don't miss the fact, of course, that we're talking about God here. God sees the lost in a way that we need to see the lost. He said, we will have a banquet. You know, Revelation has already been written. There will be a marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, some of the people that think, I'm going to be there because I deserve to, may not be there. But some of the least likely We'll be there. One way or another, we're going to have a banquet. So go get them and tell them to come. Maybe the first invitation they ever had, but you go get them. And then the servant says, Master, it's done as you commanded, and there's still room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Beg them to come. Can you imagine this? Go to the least lovely, the, the people outside the city, the, 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 the people that were not really good people at all, or maybe even criminals, or maybe even Gentiles, or something worse than that. He said, I want you to go find them, and I want you to beg them to come and sit at my table. For I say to you that None of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Why? Because the cares of this world were more important than the matters of the kingdom. Jesus was in the compelling business. He compelled a lot of the last people you'd ever want to have in the kingdom. Everyone is invited. Some people are just too good, too busy, or too selfish to accept the invitation. But there are others out there. They're hurting, they're broken, they're abandoned, unloved. Jesus cares about the least of these. And he's calling them to the table. What about us? What about me? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. Matthew eleven thirty. 29, I'm sorry, 28. Start with 28 and then go into verse 30. This is Jesus, one of his many discourses in Matthew. And he says, come to me. Look, come to me all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden. That's pretty inclusive, it isn't. I don't care how much money you have, by the way. You could still be heavy laden. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God wants a full table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. How important is that to me? I have to ask myself. I know I'm going to be there, okay? I already have my reservation. But how important is it to me that not one should perish, but that all should come to repentance? So, the heart of the matter. Take a look around the table. There are a lot of the right kind of people at the table. And many of them will never see heaven. Yet throughout his ministry, Jesus welcomed sinners, tax collectors, harlots, and the physically impaired. And so, four things to take with you. Don't be haughty. You're not more important than anybody else. Don't think you aren't important because you are. Don't give expecting a reward. If you do, you've got yours already. And don't ignore the invitation to come to the table. I don't know if there's one person in this room, I honestly didn't take a poll, okay? If there's, I don't know if there's one person in this room that has never accepted the invitation to sit at the table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if there is, I pray that you would do so today. No matter what you do with the rest of your life, it's time to think about eternity. What are you going to do with eternity? And there's only one way, according to my Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I learned that lesson many, many years ago. I came to the table through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you've not done so, today could be your day of salvation. For those of you who say, okay, I got that covered, Thurman, I'm in good shape there. Maybe the question for you is, do I fit into one of these other categories that Jesus felt like he needed to straighten out? And if that's me, what am I going to do about it? Am I, am I going to go home and say, well, that was, that was interesting. Or am I going to pray over it, meditate over it, and maybe do something about it? That's why we preach. Not because we like the sound of our voices. The marriage supper of the Lamb has room for one more guest. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. We come to our invitation time. I've already extended it. Folks, there's nothing more I, I can say. The rest of this is up to you. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to sing an invitation song. I'm going to ask you all to stand. And just meditate for a second. If you know that you need to do business with God today, come on down. There'll be people to talk to you down here. There'll be staff members to talk to you. If you know that there's decisions that you need to meditate on, don't wait until an opportune time, okay? Start working on that today. Whatever the need of your heart Let's not leave this place today without saying, God, I heard what you said, and I'm willing to do something about it. Father, we thank you for your word again. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have that we can come into this place, and we can, we can boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. That we can, we can read and hear about these teachings and know that there's an application for us today. We just pray, Father, that you will help us by your Spirit to ingrain these truths into our lives and for us to act upon them. And Lord, if there is one person, if there's just one in this room that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, let this be their day. Lord, whether they come forward or whether they grab the hand of someone nearby, it doesn't matter. But I just pray that there would be nobody walk away from the opportunity to change eternity 
when they have the opportunity. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.